Good morning, everyone. On this wonderful Sunday morning, the 11th of Tammuz, July 10th, we are starting a new Parsha. We're starting with Parsha's Balak. And uh, in Eretz Yisrael, it's Parsha's Pinchas. But we are getting started over here in Parsha's Balak. It's an interesting Parsha, fascinating story of Balak and Bilam and what happens over here. Bayar Balak ben Sipar, Ais Ashkol Asher Asa Yisrael Le'emoyri. Balak, the son of Tzipar, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. What is that? He said, these two kings whom we relied on could not resist them. We certainly cannot. Consequently, Moab became terrified. And he saw what happened with, with uh, the Amorites. He realized, okay, I cannot... Oops, I need to admit some people. I cannot... Uh, He realized we are not going to be able to handle the Jewish people through war. We're going to have to think of a new one. The younger Moyev, Moyev became terrified. For they were numerous. They were terrified of the Jewish people. And Moab became disgusted because of the children of Israel. Let's look at some Rashi. Moab became disgusted. What does that mean? They became disgusted with their own lives, as in, I am disgusted with my life, as it says somewhere else. This is an abbreviated verse. Pasuk number four. So Moab said to the elders of Midian, now this assembly will eat up everything around us as the ox eats up the greens of the field. Balak, the son of Tzipor, was king of Moab at the time. So he, what did he say to the, to the elders of Midian? It's interesting where Mo, Rashi's is is addressing the fact of were Midian and Moab were they allies? What what were they? But they but did they not always hate each other? As it says, who defeated Midian in the field of Moab? So when Midian came against Moab in battle, when Midian came when Midian came against Moab in battle, so it seems like they were enemies. Why over here does it seem like they're plotting together. However, because of their mutual fear, fear of Israel, they made peace with each other. And what did Moab see to take counsel, counsel with Midian? Since they saw that Israel was supernaturally victorious, right? We had last time, last week's parasha about the mountains moving. They said, the leader of these people was raised in Midian. Let us ask them what his character is. Moshe, right? After escaping Egypt, he lived in Midian for many years. So let's ask them, maybe they know how to deal with this guy. They told them his strength is solely in his mouth. They said, we too will come against them with a man whose strength is in his mouth. And that's why they decided to go the route of Bilam. like an ox eats the greenery, whatever the ox has eaten up no longer contains blessing because the ox uproots the plants it eats. It doesn't just eat the top grass. It eats it to its core. But Esahi at that time, he was not entitled to the monarchy. He was one of the Midianite nobles. Doesn't mean he was at that. The Pasuk says, Balak the son of Tzipar was king of Moab at that time. And actually, he wasn't supposed to. According to some of the, according to some, I'm not sure, according to some of the nobles of Sihon. When Sihon died, 
they appointed him over them on a temporary basis. Uh huh. Okay. So Balak actually wasn't supposed to be the king at the time, but that's why. So that's why the pasuk says Balak, the son of Tsipar, was king of Moab at that time, but he wasn't necessarily supposed to be king uh, by by right. Pasuk number five. Let's continue. So what did he do? By Yishlak Malach Mel Bilam Ben Baar, he sent messengers to Bilam, the son of Baar, Psaira to Psaira, Asher Alonar. Eretz Bnei Amai Likroi Loi Lemar, which is by the river of the land of his people, to call him saying, Am Yatsam Mitzrayim Hine Kisa as Eina Aretz Vuhu Yeshev Mimule. A people has come out of Egypt, and behold, they have covered the eye of the land, and they are stationed opposite me. To Pisar, Rashi says, What does it mean? It says, Bilam the son of Baar to Pisar. Pisar was actually also a hint. At the fact that he was a money changer, somebody who, you know, dealings get taken place. Because in Aramaic, Saira means a table denoting the counter over which currency transactions take place. You pay him enough, he'll take care of you. He was a man of money. Eretz B'nai, that was the, his language. Eretz B'nai Amai, the land of his people, Balak's people. He came from there. Uh, this one, uh, Bilam prophesies, telling him, you are destined to rule. If you ask, why did God bestow his shkina on a wicked Gentile? The answer is, so the nation should not have an excuse to say, had we, ha had, we had prophets, we would have repented. So he assigned them prophets. But they preached the, uh, the morally accepted barrier for at first they had restrained, they had refrained from immoral immorality. But he, Bilam, advised them to offer themselves freely for prostitution. So the reason why the, the land of his people, why was there a, a, a prophet in the, not, in the Gentiles just as great as at the Jewish people so that they shouldn't say, had they had a prophet, we would have, they would, the, the non-Jews would say, if we also had a prophet, we would have repented. No, you did have a prophet, and that prophet failed you. Likroi to call to him. This invitation was for him, for his benefit, for he promised him a large sum of money. Imyatsa mimitzrayim. A people has come out of Egypt, and should you ask, how does this have anything to do with you? How does this harm you that a people came out of Egypt? So then comes the next part of the kasuk. Hinekise. As uh, as Aina Aretz, behold, they have covered the eye of the land. Sichain and Aig, who were our guardians, they attacked them and killed them. Uyoshev Mimale, and they are stationed opposite me. That's self evident. They're next to me. Pasuk number six. So now please come and curse this people for me. Ki Atzumhu, for they are too powerful. Ki Atzumhu, me many. They are too powerful for me. Uchol Nakel by. Perhaps I will be able to wage war against them. Perhaps I will be able to wage war against them and drive them out of the land. For I know that whoever you bless is blessed, and whoever you curse is cursed. Perhaps I will be able to wage war against them. I, with my nation, will wage war against them. Another interpretation is naka, is a mishnaic term, as in he deducts menaka from the price for him. So the meaning here is to diminish them somewhat. So either if you're going to weaken them a little bit, then I will be able to take my entire army and we'll be able to defeat them. How does he know that, that Bilam uh, was able to, to perform these things and help him? Because the, in the war of Sichon against Moab, he helped Sichon defeat Moab. So we, he has a track record of being able to help in battles, and maybe he could help over here as well. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian, uh, you know, a whole delegation, uh, went with magic charms in their hands, and they came to B to Bilam, and conveyed and conveyed Balak's message to him. What does this mean? The magic 
charms in their hand. So Rashi says all types of charms. So he could not say, I don't have my tools with me. Another interpretation, the elders of Midian took this omen with them saying, if he comes with us this time, there's something to him that if he pushes us off, he is useless. Thus, when he said to them, lodge here for the night, they said he is hopeless. So they left him and went away. As it says, the Moab, Moabite nobles stayed with Bilam, but the Midianite elders left. Interesting. Okay. Pasuk number Chasvayim Raleim. He said to them, lodge here for the night. And I will give you an answer. And I will give you an answer when the Lord speaks to me. So the Moabite noble stayed with Bilam. Lodge here for the night. The divine spirit rested on him only at night. And the same applied to all Gentile prophets. So it was with Laban. God came to him in a dream at night. And as, as it says, God came to Laban the Amorite in a dream at night, like a man going to his concubine in a secret. So both uh, Laban and over here by Bilam, only at night was the time when they were able to, to, to have prophecy with Hashem. And therefore, Bilam told ba, uh, the messengers, you got to stay overnight. Because that, that's when the Lord speaks to me. If he advises me to go with people like you, I will go with you. But perhaps it is beneath his dignity to allow me to go with anyone but higher ranking nobles than you. So he has to see what Hashem is going to say. Pasuk number nine. God came to Bilam. Who are these people with you? And God, Bilam said to God, Bolak ben Sipor Melach Moyev Sholach Eli. These Bolak, the son of Tsipor, the king of Moab, sent them to me. Bolak, the son of Tsipor, although I'm not important in your eyes, I am considered important in the eyes of kings. Hine ha'am ha'yetze mi Mitzrayim. Vayechas es ena aretz. It's repeating itself a little bit over here. Behold, the people have come out of Egypt. The nation has covered the eye of the earth. The Atta. Come and curse them for me. Perhaps I will be able to fight against them and drive them out. He's repeating what uh, uh, the Balak's messengers is told him. He's repeating it back to Hashem. Oh, look at Rashi. And drive it out. That Rashi, Vigay Rashi. Drive it out of the world. Balak said only, and I will drive him out of the land. His intention was, I want only to get them away from me. But Bilam, but, but Bilam hated them more than Balak did. You see that if you look at the wording that Bilam says back to Hashem, and the wording that Balak says originally, it's actually different. Let's look at this. Let's look at the difference over here. Yeah. Yeah, it uses a different wording. Over here, Bilam goes even further and he wants to uh, not just drive them out of this land, he wants to drive them, period. He wants to get rid of them, period. Pasuk number 12. God said to Bilam, you shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people because they are blessed. You shall not go with them. He said to him, if so, I will curse them in my place. He said, don't go with them. Hashem said, don't go with them. So I said, okay, I'll curse them where I am. So then Hashem said, you shall not curse the people. He said, if so, I will bless them. They do, and then Hashem replied back, they do not need your blessing for they are blessed. As the saying goes, we say to the wasps, other additions to be, neither your honey nor your sting. Ah, that's an old saying all the way from the times of Rashi. We don't need your honey. We don't need your sting. Thank you so much, Bilam. Have a great day.
Okay, let's go to the Tanya. We finished yesterday the Shari Yechud and we're starting now today, Geras HaTshuva, the third uh, part of Tanya. And we're going to start at chapter one. Uh, this note, I actually took a quick look at it before. It basically uh, is the the idea that the Alta Rebbe, he also, he has known for two things, right? He wrote the Tanya and he wrote the Shulchan Ar. And the Rebbe explains how the, the third portion of the Tanya, which is this one, is connected to the third portion of the Shulchan Aruch. They're connected, the, the, each, each uh, part of the, the first of the Tanya and the first of the uh, Shulchan Aruch and the first of the, uh, the second and the third of the Tanya and all of that, the Tanya and the Shulchan Aruch are connected to each other. You can read that note to elaborate on how that is. Let's start. Lekuti Amarim, compilation of teachings. Chelik Shlishi, part three. Hanikra B'Shem, entitled Igeris Hatshuva. Igeris is like the 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 writing, the 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 compilation about Tshuva. Tanya B'Seif Yama, they've been taught in the Brisa at the end of Yuma. There are three types of atonement, varying according to the different categories of transgression. Let's go. And repentance accompanies each of them. So you need to have tshuva in order to, for sure, in any type of kapara, in, in order to get any type of atonement. Overall, mitzvah say. Vishav, if one failed to fulfill a positive commandment and repented, he is if if one failed to fulfill a positive commandment and repented, he's forgiven. If one violated a prohibitive commandment, like don't do this, then and he repented. His repentance is tentative, and when he goes to Yom Kippur, that's when it's mechaper. That's when he's atoned. In this instance, repentance alone does not suffice to secure complete forgiveness. It only guarantees that he will not be punished upon the arrival of Yom Kippur, at which time he is completely forgiven. So you gotta go you, for a leisa. Say you gotta go to Yom Kippur. For a mitzvah say for a positive commandment that you're instantly forgiven. Perush, the af al gav, the inyan kiyu mitzvah saseh g'doi l'shadeches loy saseh, this seems to be a perplexing because a mitzvah saseh is actually stronger than a mitzvah lo saseh. A positive commandment is stronger, is higher, is superior, supersedes a negative commandment or a prohibitive commandment. When a positive, look at the note, when a positive and negative commandments conflict, the positive commandment or command takes precedent and overrides the prohibition. For example, the wearing of tzitzis made of an admixture of wool and linen, despite the prohibition of kilaim or shotness. If you have, even though there's a prohibition of shotness, you're not allowed to mix wool in, in clothing, wool and linen. For tzitzis, it would be okay because the mitzvah of tzitzis overrides it. Since observing a positive commandment, welcome. Since observing a positive commandment thus appears to be of more value than observing a prohibition, why do we say that if you transgress a positive commandment, you could right away be atoned? You have to repent, but you right away your repenting is atoned. But, but for a negative commandment, which seems to be lower, you have to atone, you have to repent, and then atonement is only on Yom Kippur. The Alta Rebbe will now address himself to this question. His answer will also enable us to understand the spiritual effects of performance of a positive mitzvah and the spiritual blemish that results from transgressing a negative commandment. Insight into the mitzvahs from this perspective will in turn enable us to understand why a positive command 
supersedes a negative command and why it is nevertheless more difficult to atone for transgressing a negative command. So, so this dichotomy, the fact that, first of all, who, why is a positive commandment superior? That will also be understood. And why when you transgress a negative commandment, it, it is harder than transgressing a positive commandment. Briefly, the answer, follow, the answer is as follows. Should we take a sneak peek in the answer before we, uh, we learn it inside? When one performs a positive commandment, he not only fulfills God's will, but also draws down a flow of divine light into the higher spiritual realms upon and upon his own soul. The reason each positive commandment is likened to a bodily organ, right? There's 248 organs corresponding to the 248 positive commandments. This means to say that just as a bodily organ is a, recept is a, is a receptacle for the life force, which it elicits from the soul, so too is each positive commandment a vessel that draws down divine influence and vitality from the infinite insight. Let's let's learn it. Should we let's learn it inside? Let's learn it inside. Hainu mishum shayide kiu mitzvus ase. This superiority of the positive commandment that makes it supersede a negative commandment is so because by performing a positive commandment, mamshech er v'shefa ba'oil myself yoinim. When you do a positive commandment, you bring down an illumination and flow into the higher worlds from Ein Sof. Like the Zohar says, like the Zohar says, the 248 positive commandments are the 248 and 248 organs of the king. The 248 positive commandments are equated with the emotive attributes of Atsilas, which are collectively termed the king. Effluence of the emotive attributes of Atsilas that are drawn down through the performance of that particular commandment. Thus, through performing positive commands, one draws down godliness into the higher worlds. Even more than that, Vagam al Nefesh Kis, and also onto your own Nefesh Kis, and also into your own godly soul. Like we say when we make the bracha. You, Asher Kedishan, who has commanded us with his, who has uh, Kedishanu, he has um, exalted us, the mitzvah with his commandments. Fulfilling a positive command has the effect of drawing down divine light and holiness onto your soul, for which reason it surpasses and supersedes not doing a negative commandment. Aval Inyan, but that still doesn't explain why tshuva. Why, when we're doing tshuva, does it seem like the tshuva of transgressing a negative commandment more? It's a stronger, it's a harder thing. You got to do tshuva and then wait for Yom Kippur to do, to do it, to have atonement, to have kapara. tshuva concerning repentance. Though through repentance, the punishment for rebelling against God's rule and not fulfilling the the king's word is commuted. The, however, the light, the negative, the fact that that no light from the positive commandment has come down, that is lacking. Meaning, you did a sin, right? In the case, when, when we're talking about which one is greater in the positive sense, then bringing light down from the mitzvah is higher than not, than not doing any, than not doing a negative thing. But when we're talking about repentance, 
the very fact that you did a sin doesn't rectify the fact that you didn't bring down any light. In other words, that is still lacking. Whether or not you've repented for the sin, you still have not rectified the fact that no light was brought down. Like the like the like the rabbi said on a pasuk, a crookedness that cannot be corrected. Even though repentance, our sages commented, no matter how many times you're going to say Shema in the future, right? Unfortunately, the time that you missed Shema, that light cannot be brought down. So missing for, let's read the note, for after all is said and done, the world will forever be lacking the unique gift of divine light that he could have drawn down through reading the Shema on that particular occasion. Thus all the repentance can accomplish, he is now able to accomplish through repentance alone. No other steps can secure him any further atonement. So much for he who transgressed a positive precept. So when you we're going to explain the difference between over a loisa say, doing transgressing and missing a positive commandment. Missing a positive commandment, there's really only repentance. There's no atonement in the sense that you can't get back that shema that was missed. That positive thing, that po- that opportunity to bring down positive, to bring down light, that's gone. That doesn't mean that. You could still, you have an opportunity today to bring down light and tomorrow to bring down more light. So with a positive commandment, it has that, it has that double-edged sword in the fact that there's nothing more, there's no more atonement. There's just repentance. There's just from now on doing it correctly. There's no real way to bring light from the past back down. However, on contrast, if one violates a prohibition in thought, speech, or action, since evil now cleaves to his soul, remember, we're talking in absolute terms. Nobody that everybody misses some mitzvahs ase, and everybody does goes against some mitzvahs los ase, some negative prohibition commandments. Nobody's perfect. We're just when you have an under. Why are we talking about about all this? When you have an understanding about what they do and how the inner workings of tshuva work, it becomes easier. It's like a little bit of a cheat. You know how it works. You figure out how to properly do it. So going back to the Tanya. So if Abraham Mitzvah say somebody who violates a prohibition, now he has a, like a, a stain. Let's call it that, right? A little blemish. Um, this is just a bracket. In the garbs of the ten spheres of Asiya, you have fashioned garbs for the sphere for which fry for, fly forth souls for man. We thus see from the Tikkunizer that it is from the garments of the sphere that souls emanate. When a soul is blemished through sin, those garments are blemished as well. Okay, but anyhow, the point is, is that when you do a, 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 a when you transgress a negative commandment, there's a there's a blemish on your soul. Therefore, there is no atonement for his own soul nor above until Yom Kippur. As will be explained a little later, atonement means cleansing that which was blemished. This requires not only repentance, but in addition, Yom Kippur. So you, for a negative commandment, 
we're not, we don't want to just refrain from now on not doing the Avera. We also want to wash out that blemish. By the mitzvah I say, by the positive commandment, that's it. You can't go back and say Shema from two days ago. Two days ago, Shema is gone. That light cannot be brought down again. Now, no, you have to now focus on the future. For the blemish, when you, for, so not just do you not want, so if you're not, of course, the first part is repentance, not doing that thing anymore. The second part is you can actually scrub out what took place. Concerning which it was written, you shall atone for the holy says before Hashem Titaru, before God, you shall be purified. Before God, you have the purification happens before Hashem on Yom Kippur. Therefore, you shouldn't learn any leniency of positive, about the positive commandment. In other words, you shouldn't think that a positive commandment is less than a transgressing a negative commandment. It's just that it happens to be that with a negative commandment, you have the added addition that you're able to affix what took place. You're able to fix the past. Befrat the Talmud Torah, particularly uh, Talmud Torah, is we're trying to say how mitzvahs I say, how positive commandments are extremely important, especially the study of Torah. Vad Rabbah, on the contrary, Amr Rabbi Sinan Zechren of Racha, Viter Akadus Parchu, Alavaita Zarabhulu, Afsh, Ain Krasos, and Misos Bastin, Velay Viter Albitil Talmud Torah. God has, in certain, cer certain instances, glossed over even idolatry, incest and murder, though a uh, uh, chorus, right? Cutting off and capital punishment are involved, but didn't in those three, but did not excuse the neglect of Talmud Torah. So basically the altar is saying, one thing's for sure, you shouldn't learn from this brysa, which says that the, 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 which we learn that the negative commandment, you need both, uh, repentance and atonement, you shouldn't learn from that, that positive commandments are not uh, as important. On the contrary, positive commandments are more important. As we see from this uh, uh, Brysa, or where, where, I'm not sure where it comes from, that Hashem sometimes glosses over even the three terror, you know, the worst sins, but he does not excuse the neglect of Torah learning. So now let's continue learning the the brisa. Of our alkresos of Mrs. Bastin, if one commits a sin punishable by kares, I'm, I'm not sure how they translate kares over here. I, excision, but kares is like being cut off. Umisas Bastin or 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 execution from the Bastin. True of Yom Kippur Thailand, the Surim Imarkin. Repentance and Yom Kippur are tentative so that the individual is not punished and suffers scour. Perish goimrin hakafara v'humilashin mirika v'shtifa l'tzach tzecha hanefesh. They complete the atonement. There's a lot of brackets. Ki kapara hilashin kinuach. For kapara, atonement is the term for the preceding stages of cleaning, removing the uncleanliness of the sin. Sins that are, very simply put, sins that are punished by car the highest level of sins, ones that are punished by Kuris or Misa, they are not cleaned away through repentance on Yom Kippur alone. There has to be something stronger. There has to be a greater suffering, unfortunately. And that's why those ones, they need, God forbid, either Kuris or Misa or Misa or, or death. Those are ones that are, are those are uh, repentances that are not able to Yom Kippur cannot do. As it was written, with a rod shall I remember their sin, when affl with afflictions their iniquity. Thus far, the brisa, that's the whole brisa. But the, the beginning of the brisa was 
a big focus, and this was the Brisa in Yuma that said that over al mitzvahs ase, that when you are transgressing a positive commandment, repentance is enough, but when you are uh, going against a negative commandment, you need repentance and Yom Kippur. And also, side note, the end of the Brisa says, if you do something really terrible, unfortunately, Yom Kippur will not even be able to mechaper that. You have to go through physical suffering in this world. All right, what a heavy uh, start to the Tanya, to Geras HaTshuva, but uh, we will continue tomorrow. The Tehillim for Sunday, the 11th of Tammuz, is chapter 60 through 65. It was once again, as always, a, a pleasure, pleasure to learn with you.